And today, Russia is stronger, I would argue, economically than it was before the war began. Our sanctions have been ultimately quite helpful to the Russians. Uh, they, they are not a part of our Western financial system to the extent that they might have been hurt by us seriously. How have the sanctions been helpful to Russia? Well, they've managed to sell all of their energy products, all of their minerals, everything, agricultural products, through others at higher prices that have ultimately reached their target destination in Europe and other parts of the world anyhow. So the amount of hard currency, if you will, from the West that's pouring in has actually increased. At the same time, they've discovered that they could sell virtually everything if they needed to to China and India to a lesser extent. Those two countries, these are over a billion people in each country, enormous economies. They want to do business with Russia. So that the absence of the European market, per se, has not turned out to be this terrible experience that everyone in the West assumed it would be. Wasn't that a chess game a lot of people saw coming because both India and China cannot self, will never be self-sufficient on energy? Well, I suppose so. Uh, you know, I don't know that anybody regarded it as a, a chess game because the difference between Putin, whatever mistakes he made in terms of assumptions, shrink to insignificance next to the mistakes that we've made, I would argue, because we made assumptions about Russia that were just completely wrong, as, uh, just like the rest of the world. Number one, Russia is a backward economy that will collapse quickly if we sanction it. In other words, that they're, they're not a true nation state in the Western sense. They don't have a developed economy. They can't survive. Yeah, we regarded it as some sort of mega island. Yeah, yeah. They don't have a real scientific industrial base. Now suddenly we see all of these factories uh, in Russia running 24 hours a day, seven days a week, producing ammunition, weapons, missiles, all these things we said they were going to run out of very, very quickly and couldn't replenish. We said that no one would support Russia, that Russia would be isolated. Well, in fact, I, I would argue that most of the world actually backs Russia against us that we and the Europeans are increasingly on an island all by ourselves. And Russia is not going to fall apart. Russia has become more cohesive. This is a state that rests on the foundation of Orthodox Christianity and Russian ethnicity. Now, there are plenty of people inside Russia who are not ethnic Russians. Those people are treated very well. They are treated as equal partners inside Russia. All you have to do is look at the Chechens. You know, And the Chechens are brilliant soldiers, by the way. I keep hearing people say, well, they're not really that good. Well, you could not be more wrong. Those people are superb, and they are fiercely loyal. And by the way, if you go back to the czarist period, every czarist army had contingents in it that were Kazakhs, Uzbeks, Chechens, others, Turkic peoples, Tartars, working with them and fighting with them against whomever the enemy was, whether it was the Ottomans or the Austrians or whomever. So the, the point is that uh, Russia is more cohesive than we are. If you're looking for internal unrest, discontent, divisive forces, you can find those in spades inside American society. But that's not the case in Russia at all. So when, when, you, when you look at the economy-wise, one may say, yeah, they're doing better today. Uh, but even prior to the war, they had a big birth and uh, death problem. I don't know if you've seen the numbers on their birth and death rate, if you want to pull that up. That's not a, uh, a good look. The closest thing you can compare that to as a case study, they're, they're having more people dying than being born. There's only one other country you can compare this to, and you, you know who that is. It's one of their allies. It's China. They, those guys have the similar issue. India is a complete opposite. And uh, we're not doing that great ourselves, but... Uh, Russia is not a good place when it goes. It comes down to that. But I want to go back to the thought. Well, wait, wait a minute before you leave. Yeah, uh, Putin agrees with you. Yeah, and Putin has tried very, very hard to re reverse that. He the first thing he tried to do is to prevent the brain drain. Everybody with any talent or ability had been getting out of Russia since 1992. So he's tried to reverse that. I think he's had some success. He's tried to encourage people to have How, large, by the way, if you, if you don't mind, how did he do the first one? I'm curious. Basically by finding employment for scientists and engineers that otherwise had nowhere to go. He said, oh, we've got to find employment for these people so that we can keep them here. We have to reward them for their talent. I think he's done reasonably well there. When it comes to the rest of the economy, you know, turning around this attitude that why should I bring two or three children into a world that's uh, dominated by alcoholic men that are destroying themselves and committing suicide mm -hmm. has turned out to be pretty tough. I think he's made some progress there. I think this war is going to help him enormously because I think the war is awakening a sense of Russian identity 
that is far, far stronger and greater than anything we thought existed. All you have to do is talk to the people that are inside Russia and ask Russians what they think. Everybody says, well, they're all afraid of Putin, so they're not going to tell you the truth. That's not true. That's just not true. And we're hearing as exactly what I said. Russia is closer, united, more today than I think it has been in at least 30 years or 40 years. Okay. So, so then uh, as, a, as a competitor, whoever you go up against, you're going to do better if you put them as being overly calculating, meaning – it's, it's naive to just say it's a simplistic war. Let's just do this. This is what's going to happen. We're going to be this, right? Okay. Uh, you know, for me, sometimes you know how an enemy uh, forces you to do something to come out and say, see, I told you this is what they wanted to do the entire time. So, for example, I want to get your feedback on this. So, I, you know, NATO is trying to do whatever they can to get Ukraine to be part of NATO. No, that's not what we're trying to do. No, that's exactly what they're trying to do. And this is why they promised us they would never do this. And now they're going to be doing this. Nope, that's not what they're doing. So he's pushing, 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 pushing. And then all of a sudden, you know, the article comes out from Guardian. If you want to show that article real quick, I think it's Guardian. Uh, uh, you know which one I'm talking about. NATO accelerating the membership. Yep. Uh, NATO allies back fast track membership for Ukraine says cleverly, U.S. Foreign Secretary says Ukraine has evolved quickly as Zelensky tells Summit it can be engine of green growth. So <laughs> all of this time that they're talking about this, this is now leading to, you know, we have to use this as an opportunity to bring him into NATO. Then Putin's going to come out and say, well, I told you guys this was the entire intention, the entire, you know, this is why I'm doing X, Y, Z, because I knew you guys were doing this. Is he that calculating of a guy that he's forcing his opponent and his enemy to expose their hand? Or is it just accidentally that this happened because he didn't think the war was going to last this long? You know, I, I hesitate. You know what I'm asking. Yeah, right? yeah, I, I do. And uh, I think the man's highly intelligent. And I there is no doubt in my mind that he views what you just said as a, a welcome development, that the his opponent is essentially revealing his hand, saying this is what we're really all about. But I do think at the beginning, he still thought there was a degree of goodwill in the West that he could exploit. And there is none. That's what he's found out. Unpack that. I think because of his experience uh, watching various administrations, remember he met with Bush, he subsequently met with Obama, and, and ultimately with Trump. Each time he was be trying to understand us, trying to understand what we were about. And I think he listened to what was said in private. And he convinced himself that these people really aren't the enemy. You know, that they are unreasonably obsessed with or fascinated with NATO, which he doesn't see any reason for. I mean, quite frankly, he, you know, since he had one of the things that's very funny is people say, well, he was going to invade Eastern Europe. Well, wait a minute. You told me back in March that his army was small and incapable and now you're telling me he was always going to invade. I mean, which, which, which is, is it? It's yeah. a bunch of nonsense. So yeah. he wasn't going to invade. He wanted to do business with everybody badly because he knows that if Russia is to continue to develop and grow, he needs technology. Most of the technology that he wants is in Germany. So Germany is enormously important to Russia and always has been. Well, now he's turning away because he's trying to substitute uh, Chinese, Indian, and other ec economic uh, powers for German cooperation. But the bottom line is that I think uh, Putin miscalculated up front. There was no goodwill. He thought there was. And now he knows it. So what are you going to do about it, Mr. Putin? And I think the Russians are all standing around saying, okay, we like you. You've done a great job. Uh, you know, the army is ready. It's up and running. It's now large enough and strong enough to do what needs to be done, Mr. Putin. What are you going to do? Yeah, and, you know, uh, makes sense. We're going to see how much of that was, you know, uh, wasn't expecting it. He was just kind of going in to do it, and then now all of a sudden the hands are being shown. But let's look at the other side. You know, the other side is anytime uh, it happens in sports, it happens in families, it happens in companies. Oh, look what's going on in Amazon. Six of Jeff Bezos' C-suite executives all resigns on the same day. You know, hey, look at the Elon Musk today with Twitter. 1,250 employees resigned. That place is a civil war today, right? And they'll say things like this. And us as readers, we're not in it. We're like, oh, wow, 
shit's hitting the fan in, right. you know, Twitter. Shit's hitting the fan in this place. If you look at it where with a, a Wagner Group, okay, Wagner Group, or you know, whatever they want to call themselves, um, these guys come out, and he's a billionaire himself. He's done well for himself. And, hey, our goal is to do this, and our goal is to do that. And then story comes out saying Putin disappears after Wagner uh, – uh, coup, chaos, Daily Mail, Russian President Vladimir Putin has not been seen publicly since he addressed the nation regarding the Wagner Group failed putsch uh, amidst uh, uh, rumors of uh, Putin's flight uh, to Tver region. U.S. Secretary of State Anthony Blinken, wonderful guy, by the way, noted cracks emerging in the Russian administration. Putin, in a pre-recorded message, termed the Wagner troops move as a Stab in the back of our troops around the people of Russia. What we are facing now is a treason. Okay. And then obviously talks about who Yevgeny is and what he's done, all this stuff, which I'd love for you to talk about that as well. When that happens from the outset, it's very easy for the enemy to say, look what's going on over there. Even his people don't support his decision. He's about to be replaced. It's about to be very quickly like the last time this happened. We saw this 25 years ago when this took place. Within a week, somebody came in and took over Russia. That's exactly what's going to be happening, right? Uh, uh, opposing message of how you said this thing's going to be done in Ukraine very quickly. The other side said, he's about to fall in the next week. Watch, this thing's going to happen very quickly. That's not a good look when that happens where the leader of a country has to leave because they're worried about what's going to happen to him. So one, from the optics standpoint, two, from he's got an 89% approval rating. If he does, why are people going against him? And there's clips of people supporting Yevgeny saying, hey, thank you for doing this. Optics matter. Well, uh, the people that were thanking uh, Yevgeny Prigozhin were not thanking him for rising up in some sort of uprising. They were thanking him and the Wagner Group for their heroic uh, performance on behalf of the Russian people. And those same people that were doing that also said, you know, we, we love Putin. We love our president. I, I think people, first of all, made the mistake of assuming that what was happening was an uprising. It never was. And Prigozhin made that very clear. Uh, we'll learn more in the future. But what we know at this point is the following. First of all, Putin didn't flee anywhere. Putin wasn't afraid of anything. He has 30,000 troops. He did take 10,000 in the Ministry of Interior forces. These are very, very uh, heavily armed police and moved them into various areas because they had intelligence already on many Ukrainian terrorist cells. And they simply went out there and eliminated all of these. That was simply a case of let's go do it, get it over with, and in the event that there's something going on between them and this uh, group in, in the Wagner group. It turns out that uh, Putin did talk directly to uh, Prigozhin. That came out today. Assuming that's true, uh, he, he claimed that he was talking to Lukashenko, who's the president of Belarusia. Now, if that's in fact true and Putin talked to him, then the whole thing ended very quickly. And the argument for ending it, according to Prigozhin, was we don't want to we'll shed any Russian blood. So then the question is, why did you do it? And one of the key reasons, I think, that there, there are two possibilities. One is, I think Prigozhin was speaking for a lot of people who were very dissatisfied with Karazimov and Shoigu, Shoigu because they feel strongly that this Ukrainian war should be brought to a close. Let's stop it. The only way to stop it is to advance, to attack, and crush the enemy. And their view is that there's so little left now on the Ukrainian side. Why are we waiting? Let's get this done. The longer we wait, the greater the possibility that NATO and its friends will find an excuse to intervene, and we don't want that to happen. Putin's taken the position, well, I'm holding back just in case NATO intervenes. In other words, I've got hundreds of thousands of troops. I've got a huge strategic reserve. If they're dumb enough to intervene, then I've got that, you know, on hand that I can employ. That's a debate that is unfolding. We're hearing about a shakeup in the Russian high command. You'll recall that Putin had a meeting with some journalists, uh, a small group of them, and he talked to them for three hours, something you never hear anybody in the United States do, any politician, that is. And he was very straightforward and frank. We had the transcripts, and one of the things that came up was a discussion about the senior leadership. And one of the journalists said, we, you know, we're, we're concerned because we're getting feedback from a lot of soldiers 
that we can do better, that we need more aggressive, more capable leaders. And he said, you know, I think there's something to that, and I've got to look into it. I've got to look at it. I think we're going to see a shakeup in the high command. Now, there's a, an unsubstantiated rumor out there that the commander-in-chief of Russian airborne forces is now taking over the theater. I don't know. I haven't seen it confirmed anywhere. That could be the case. Uh, also, in the same report, Garazimov is returning to his essential duties as chief of the general staff. He's no longer going to run anything in connection with the war in Ukraine. Uh, Shoigu uh, seems to be Shoigu. He's Putin's friend. I don't think Putin holds him because he's a civilian. He's not a professional soldier directly responsible for anything that's not right. So I think we'll see some shakeup in the high command, and that may foreshadow some offensive action. Now, here's another theory, that this was a, a carefully constructed show for the West uh, to convince everybody that uh, Russia was falling apart and see who said what and so forth. I don't buy that. Yeah, I don't either. I buy the first argument. Yeah. And people say, well, you know, my gosh, how could this happen? George Marshall relieved 32 Corps and Division commanders during less than three years of fighting during World War II. Uh, large numbers of senior officers were removed and, and changed and moved around and given new commands. Uh, this, is, this is not unusual in war. Uh, it happens. If it doesn't happen, you're in a lot of trouble. I mean, one of the complaints that I've had about the U.S. military and the Army in particular is no change. Why no change? Well, it's a stagnant pool of people and talent. You need fresh blood, fresh eyes, and I'm sure that Putin has discovered that's required in the, in the Russian military, and I think we'll see it. Happy 4th of July, too. We have a special event that's coming up with Tom Brady, Mike Tyson, and Will Guidera in Miami, Vault Conference. It'll be August 30th to September 2nd. This weekend for 4th of July, we're running a special. Buy one, get one free. Bring your spouse, bring your business partner, bring your running mate. If you haven't yet registered, click on a link below or above. Get registered. Looking forward to spending three days with you in Miami. 